so yeah, I wanted to um, definitely, you know, focus on women's history and just, you know, your, your experience. But I also want to talk about what you're doing. So we'll pack all of that in. All um, right. When you guys started, things were, you know, different 70s, 80s. So what do you feel hasn't changed for women in music still today? Um, well, I don't see as many... Um, bands that are comprised all of women you know i see a lot more musicians and people working women working as in the music industry but there doesn't seem to be as many uh bands you know that for all the for all the bands that you think of you know anyone from you know imagine dragons to you know Who's a band anymore? Anyway, uh, Green Day, U2, um, gosh, uh, and they're all guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't see as many. That that doesn't seem to have changed that much. There doesn't seem to be that many women wanting to start bands with other women, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, what else hasn't changed? Um, I feel like I there's this kind of sense of community, but. I don't know. You know, I feel like the last time we kind of had that, and maybe maybe this is something as you're thinking about it. Um, you know, I feel like in the '90s there was like definitely that scene in music, and there was more of a collaborative thing. I feel like now it seems that way, but it's all surface. It's it's like a collaboration, a one-off, but there's no real community. And is 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 that what you're kind of sensing? Like, there's no um, organic unions. No. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what kind of scenes are going anywhere right now. I mean, uh, rock scenes seem to happen very organically and, and stuff. And I, yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of too many that are in, happening. And they seem usually they're kind of a regional thing. Mm -hmm. So there might be something going on somewhere, but I'm not sure. But in terms of like any kind of female solidarity, I think, you know, probably you know me too movement and um mm -hmm. you know uh, somewhat around reproductive rights and stuff but just like i think it just uh, it's a reflection of where we are as a society in general that we're all very divided and polarized and and i don't think um uh, you know women are finding that any easier to overcome than than general people so and it, i think it just it's a it's systemic from music to yeah. politics to you know community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no it's true i mean i think i think within the industry i think women have a little bit more power than they did yeah. 30 40 years ago even 20 years ago yeah uh, change is very slow and i i think you're seeing more women, you know, in the studio, uh, engineering that know their way around, you know, recording and uh, mastering and producing. Uh, so you see a lot of women in, in that realm. And um, ob obviously, we've always been songwriters and stuff. So yeah, I, I think, I think it's just a slow thing. And that there's just, it's always a numbers game is the way I look at it. And if you have you know, a hundred males and a hundred females, you know, there's the percentage of males that are likely to go into a career that's maybe more non-traditional for women is going to be greater. There's going to be fewer women. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm, I'm always very interested in visibility and making sure that the women that do choose a less uh, less traveled road are kind of seen, and, you know, and seen in the media and, and held up because then the other ones, it, it becomes, you know, the other women that like, oh, well, maybe just like in the, the 50s and 60s, I think women started seeing that they didn't have to be homemakers and, and mothers only. They could have all kinds of careers, but they had to see that happen before it entered their mind. My mom was in England and young teenage girls w were never expected to go to college. And she mm -hmm. married and moved here. And only when she was in the United States did she see women her age going to college. Yeah. So 
it's yeah. kind of like that. Yeah, I um, that no, it's true. My my grandmother's actually from England as well, and my aunt was born there, so I have a little bit of English. Yeah. <laughs> She's a war bride, World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool era. <laughs> Great generation. <Yeah. laughs> um, no, no, I definitely. And you mentioned me too, and you know, just you know talk to people who like worked in the music industry in the 80s and, and before that and they were like an a and r and they were in pr and some crazy stories and and i don't even think i can't even imagine me too back then with all of the stuff that was happening in in you know threats and and outward sexual harassment and things i've heard but i know yeah. you guys have you know obviously experienced that um I still feel like it's a little prevalent today, but I mean, how do you? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, in my career, I was lucky. I, I didn't experience that sort of thing, you okay. know, but uh, I know I, I can't even imagine just the culture of like just the A&R guy back in the eighties. They were, you know, it was a yeah. hard partying kind of, kind of almost like the, almost like the, the stereotypical agent, you know, Ari and Entourage. That's kind of mm -hmm. the A&R guys were like, I can't even imagine what it was like for the women. And we saw very few women. I mean, we would travel and tour and meet the local rep in every city, and it was never a woman. But wow. we were lucky. We had some women at IRS records that, that were awesome. But, okay. but in general... There, there weren't a lot. Alice DeBure, the who played in Fanny, she was at A and M, mm -hmm. and um, it was always a pleasure for us when there was a woman in the business. But the program directors at the radio stations, all men. Oh yeah, I know. Well, that's definitely changed. With that, what that's a great thing. So, um, I mean, I, I I read something that you wrote on Ronnie Spector, and I, I love Ronnie. I mean, you know, being here in New York, and I, I'm 44 now, so I one of my fondest memories is walking into CBGB's when it was still open and Joey Ramone was having like some unsigned band night. And I walk in and to my left is Joey Ramone standing there with Ronnie Spector. It's like, Oh my, <laughs> two of my wow. favorite people on the planet. <laughs> wow. That was yeah. like that had ingrained in my head. <laughs> yeah. That part of the article, the wording, cause I, I mentioned her bridging you know, that 60s thing yeah. to punk rock. And then I mentioned Genya Reva and producing. Mm -hmm. And and then the next statement was about Ronnie, but because they it came after Genya, it sounded like I was talking about her, but, oh, yeah. but, but uh, Ronnie really um, had those same, the punk street mm -hmm. elements, you know? Yeah, no, I was just wondering, I brought her up because I was just wondering, are there some key females um, that, pushed you into music and then do you feel you still feel their presence still or are there some new artists that you're kind of getting a little jolt or inspired by well I mean I, I always have to mention Susie Quattro people that have read my book yeah. or read any of my interviews know that that I owe my my music career to Susie Quattro because she was the first woman I saw fronting a band, leading a band, playing an instrument, uh, being the lead singer, not just the lead singer, but playing an instrument and leading the band. Mm -hmm. And there were women before her. There was Fanny, but I didn't know about Fanny. There was um, a lot of bands in the 60s that we now can find on YouTube or blogs and fanzines. But back when I started playing in the 70s, there wasn't any of that stuff. So I didn't know about them. It was only by chance that I saw Susie Quattro on TV in England. Mm -hmm. So I owe a, a huge uh, debt to, to Susie. And um, uh, Debbie Harry was, was really important to me because she was a songwriter and I'd never seen anyone be so a, like likable to women, but still very sexy, but still very street and urban. And there wasn't, there wasn't this kind of like, it wasn't an over, it was a very interesting, cool sexuality that, that yeah. didn't seem cheesy or, or uh, gratuitous. You know, it seemed really an extension of who she was. It didn't seem manufactured yeah. for men, you yeah. know? Yeah. And that was, I, it was never my thing. You know, like I, I, I didn't even think I was had anything, any sex appeal or attractiveness. So 
that wasn't part of my deal at all. But, um, but just seeing it was, was cool. Um, and knowing that you could be sexy and be attractive without it being just, I don't know, in that kind of, I don't know what to surface, say. In that, it's like surface and nothing underneath. It was yeah. Like, and, um, and then um, I was really, I think a lot of all women were inspired by Chrissy Hind, you know, her, her songs and her, her just delivery, her, her, her voice, her songs, her toughness, you know, she was super tough, but again, without, it was just, it was okay to be how she was, you know, without, it didn't feel like a, a, a put on a persona. And so it was very much like Debbie in that way. It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to be the tough girl and I'm going to be the sexy girl. It wasn't, it didn't feel like that. It felt more like I can be who I am. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, let's see, women that inspired me. And I'm um, sure they still do. Right? Yeah. Still I mean, I think the first female rock star I was really aware of was Janis Joplin. I'm from Texas and she spent some time in Austin. Yeah. So there was always kind of that, even though Austin and Texas didn't really support her. Sorry about that. They didn't support her, but they certainly claimed her once she was successful. But it seemed like it seemed like um, she was always portrayed in a kind of cartoonish way, yeah. you know, in terms of being uh, a, a, a hard partying, hard living rock star. Whereas like Jimi Hendrix or 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 Jim Morrison, they were like more of these romantic um, kind of. You know, but Janice was always kind of portrayed almost like this cartoon for being the same, doing the same shit that the guys were doing. Yeah, exactly the same. And it wasn't until I read uh, Holly George Warren has an excellent biography about Janice Joplin called Janice. And it wasn't until I read that book that I even knew how in control of her career she was. You know, she was in the studio all that she didn't just go in and sing her parts and leave. She was in there. She was picking songs. She was working with writers to make sure she, she was really in control of what she wanted to present as a singer and as an artist. And I never knew that about Janis Joplin. And I love that book because it presents her as more than just this kind of fuck up with a great voice, exactly. you know, and a wild sense of style which is kind of all I knew before. So anyway, um, later on, in, when I started kind of really embracing my roots, I became really enamored of um, some of the women who, sorry, I'm just okay. kidding. I don't know how to turn off my notifications. I thought it was my, my thing. <laughs> um, let's see. So um, I was really enamored when I found out when I, I kind of went back to my roots in the, in the nineties and started, you know, going back to guitar and, and starting bands and was a little lost musically because the go-go's had kind of obliterated everything that just, once I became a go-go, it just became everything to me. And I, it took me several years to go, let's just go back to square one. You know, the music that I was listening to, I was playing guitar in Austin, Texas. And so I thought, I'm just going to kind of start a, a blues band and just because the stones and the faces and the yard birds, I just thought of all the bands and the Beatles that yeah. started with kind of American roots and blues and then kind of followed, but let that kind of help form their direction. And I was lost musically. So I did that. And in that time, this is a long backstory, just to say that I got really enamored to, I'd never found out about Memphis Minnie mm. and uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp and, wow. and I'd never seen Bo Diddley. So I didn't know that Bo had women playing guitar. So again, speaking to what I mentioned earlier, that visibility thing, it's a shame that the, the girls that were 15 and 16, like I was looking up to Led Zeppelin and the Stones and the Beatles. It's a shame that we didn't know about all these women that were doing stuff too. And it's really just because 
you know, they weren't famous like Led Zeppelin or they weren't famous like the Rolling Stones, but they were there and they were doing it. And it's too bad, you know, that's kind of what's, I guess books would have been the only way to know about them or something. Yeah. But I was enthralled to find out and I was blown away to think like how revolutionary it would have been to be in the, the 1930s, to, you know, to be a black woman earning a living as a guitar player, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, amazing stuff. Um, wow. And then that led me just to seeing some of the, the, the big bands, you know, that were women that were just as just tearing it up. So I think we have a fascinating history in music, a songwriter. As songwriters, women have, have always held their own and been recognized as such. I mean, I was, I was always, of course, you know, in awe of Carole King, you know, and um, Joni Mitchell and, you know, all the icon women of, of the 60s and 70s that were writing songs and, and delivering them and succeeding. Uh, they were, they were huge. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but again, it was, it was seeing that, that, that we weren't, um, we weren't absent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, one more thing with the women's history that I, I did want to touch on. Do you, do you feel, um, where do you, where do you see social media playing in on this? And I know it's, maybe it's a crazy question, but do you feel like it's a benefit or detriment and for women specifically as artists? Um, well, it depends what it's used for. I mean, it, it really, it really depends for many people. And I include myself and in, in, in the, for many people that the social media is how, I let people know that I'm playing a show or that I have a book out or that I've released a single. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not a big star. Nobody really knows what I'm doing unless I'm in the go-go's. And if I don't have that access to, to an audience, I'm not always going to get, you know, I mean, I could hire a publicist and put out a press release mm -hmm. or, you know, I could tweet something or put something on Instagram and probably get more people to know about it. So I, I, for, I mean, that's what it's about for me. I, I don't really know um, what, I mean, it just depends. I don't, I don't really know. I think, if I understand. I think people get really, I think, I think if people really get into it and it, it becomes, it starts overshadowing the art, you know, I think it could get to that point and I've seen it where it's just all about likes. But then if you're using it, you know, Chuck D said, you know, you have to use social media as a tool, not a toy. Then again, he posts like every five minutes. <laughs> I yeah. love it though. But, but you use it yeah. as a tool, like what, what you're saying. That's how I use yeah. it. And there's some people that, you know, you kind of just, yeah, you wish they would go away. That, that <laughs> without male, naming names, you just, mm -hmm. like, they just, uh, it just shows, it shows a lack of, some people have a lack of style, judgment, boundaries, all of it, yeah. you know, which yeah. is, which can, you know, kind of, it can, it can definitely affect your feeling about their art. But generally, I, generally a good song to me is a good song, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just thinking like how, how it affects the artist when they're so focused on that and not so much on the art. And I've seen that, you know, and so, crazy but yeah I just wanted to throw that out there with women um and going back to writing you were you're mentioning songwriters for you um and getting into you um do you feel like songs still come to you in the same way as they always have has that shifted um well I'm I feel like I always have my antenna out I'm always recept I'm always receiving and uh phrases, titles, lines, melodies. So it's always there. My, um, my muse tends to be leaning more towards being a writer um, of literature, short stories. Um, uh, my memoir was kind of, I wanted to make a foundation that I could be, that, that would open the door to me being viewed as a, as a writer, as well as a musician. I, I I feel like, um, and I have not, I've nothing but gratitude and feel enormously blessed for my career. But having said that, 
I don't want my life to be about being the bass player in the Go-Go's. I'm, I'm way more than that. And um, I'm a great producer. I'm a really good songwriter. I'm a really good guitar player. And I'm a really good writer. And I don't want the sum of my life to be that I played on Beauty and the Beat and played the bass lines <laughs> to We Got the Beat. And, and, and oh, and I wrote Vacation and brought that to the band. I, you know, these are wonderful accomplishments. And maybe, maybe to many people, they're like, that's it. That's all you get. <laughs> Go retire and be that. happy. <laughs> but that's not, that's not what I want. I feel like I'm way more than that. And that was a long time ago. So I've been very actively my whole it's probably since I got sober, mm-hmm. uh, you know, pursuing my education, getting a college degree, making records, recording, learning software, making video, just doing things. I'm, I'm interested in the world. I'm interested. And I do miss writing songs. For me, a lot of times songwriting is um, a, a, a form of therapy. It's like a friend to me. I have many songs that you know, probably will never get heard because they served a purpose of helping me process difficult experiences. Yeah, no, I I get that. I sometimes write things just to help me get through certain things. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I need to record because like I use Pro Tools to write mostly now. I mean, I will sit down with a guitar or something, but I just enjoy sitting down and building something and kind of piecing it together and going, Oh, this is cool. It looks in this beat and playing a lot. I, I enjoy writing on, on pro tools. And that's the sort of thing that if you don't keep doing it, like you'll go back. It's like, Oh, I'm going to go work on a song and like, Oh, I can't remember how to nudge this. I can't remember how to do that. And then you spend half your creating time looking up YouTube, how to, remember how to do something that used to be natural. So I try to get in there mm-hmm. and not waste too, not let too much time go by without working on my software because otherwise when I do want to do it, I've forgotten how to do half the things and it, you just start, it just, it's kind of a creativity killer when you just have yeah. to keep looking at how to do basic shit that you used to just I know. do. It's a muscle. It's like anything else. And it's like with writing too, you know, if you, yeah. Oh, even like Word or, you know, Photoshop, any program, if you don't use it, you lose it. And you can find it. You can find it. It's just kind of time consuming. <laughs> um, tell me how this um, the rock camp came together. And was this something you were thinking about for for a long time? And wanted- the rock fantasy camp? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I had been aware of it for many years. And it always seemed very focused on um, men and very focused on uh, a genre that was leaned towards hard rock and heavy metal. And I was really pleased when during the pandemic, they approached me to do a master class. And they were really open to me doing it however I wanted. Because I said, if it's going to be on a Zoom, I don't really want to just sit there and talk about the bass. And um, um, so I said, if I can do a master class that just covers everything, writing songs, playing the guitar, playing the bass, uh, being in a band, um, just kind of everything that I know stuff about. I've been doing, I've been in bands since the age of 16. I've never not been in a band. And I have a lot, I've learned a lot and have a lot to offer. So they were really cool about that. So I did this and it sold out and then we added another one and it was really, really fun. There was, there was probably in each master class I did probably five to 10 women that were in their fifties that were just just starting out, just like kind of, and they felt safe with me. You know, they felt safe saying, you know, I, I just started playing the bass or I just got a guitar and, and it was really wonderful to be able to encourage that. And, you know, say to a beginner, like, Hey, you're at the beginning. I can tell you something that took me a long time to get to was like, just enjoying it for the sake of doing it and being proud. Like I made a record in 2005 that probably sold 3000 copies, but God, I'm proud of it. You know, I I don't need to sell 30,000 or 3 million. I'm so proud of my record. I it's, you know, I'm proud of the songs I did 
and I'm proud of everything about it, everything I wrote, my production. And, and I thought, what a wonderful thing to get to the point where you create something. I'm like that with my short stories. I write a short story, and if it never gets published, yeah. I'm just proud. And it's, it's fun to tell people that are starting out, like, aim for that. Because yeah. success is like, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Especially, you know, if you're just starting out in your 50s, you know, I don't know what your dreams are. I'm, don't, it's not on me to, to squash anyone's dreams, but the sooner anybody that's artistic or creative can get to that place of just enjoying doing it and being proud of what they've done and making themselves happy, you're kind of in a winning yeah. spot. We, we think too much of the end result. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. And when I was young, that's all I cared about. You know, that's all I cared about was making it in the business, making it in the, I just didn't want a job. I didn't want to be a regular person. I wanted to rock out and I wanted to do it with girls my age. And that's, you know, I probably would have, I probably would have, once I, once I, uh, that's all I, whatever it took to do that. That's what I wanted to do. I mean, if the Go-Go's, when I met them, if they'd said, oh, that's nice, you play guitar, but we just need a bongo player, I probably would have said, okay, <laughs> I'll play bongos. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I, I get that. And um you know, I have to catch myself with that too, you know, because I do love writing and, and I need to do more creative writing outside of this, you know, talking to you and this editorial type stuff. Yeah, this stuff is very hard. I've, I've gotten a few gigs doing what you're doing and I find it really difficult, it's... really difficult. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, my hat's <laughs> off, my hat's <laughs> off to anyone that does, you know, writes for magazines and journalism because to me what's easier is doing personal essays, you know, creative nonfiction or fiction that that is fun. The other stuff is just like, I feel like I'm just like balance. Crafting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a friend I have. Um, he's a great cook. And everyone's always saying, well, you have to do this professionally. He's like, No, I just enjoy doing it. He makes amazing like, it's seriously Michelin star. The guy is amazing. Wow. I mean, you know, that kind of level. And um, I get it, you know, some, I, I, I have to catch myself before I say, you know, you should do something with this. <laughs> but he just wants to do it for people, you know, he, he's proud of it, you know, but he doesn't, he's not looking for an end result with it. That's great. Um, you, you mentioned uh, having a crazy week starting tomorrow. So what's going on with, like, what's coming up now with the Go-Go's and everything? Um, we leave in the morning for... Um to do a series of five, uh, five, I think five shows. And then in the middle, we're doing a television show on our one day off. And then I'm doing a book event with Gina downtown. So it's pretty much, we've been rehearsing up until today's the first day off. And, um, and then tomorrow it's just off and running. Wow. Well, well, I hope to see you um, if you make it out to New York. <laughs>